president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Dr. Olisa Bakoba, speaks on governance strategies for President Tinubu. We also have more from Professor Wale Shoinka as he calls on lawyers and the federal government to do more to protect the human rights of citizens. Also showing on Law Weekly, the Nigerian Bar Association is set to begin mentorship program for young lawyers. So our recap of the top trending legal stories in the news. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Sheyeli. The former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Olisa Agbakoba, has been speaking about governance strategies for President Bola Tinubu's administration, from issues of political governance to constitutional governance and much more. He details weak governance structures and says what is required is to strengthen it through critical laws and policies. Governance is about a foundation, a country that has been struggling with a foundation for 23 years cannot be a serious country and there has to be a need for some speed. So the Tenth Assembly must immediately address this problem of continuous talking about Nigeria. Remember what Bolaige said about the survival of Nigeria and it rings, because I was there that day, it still, it still rings in my head that in a situation of a political arrangement such as Nigeria's, the first question is, just like I have a wife, do I want to be married? Question number one. So in Nigeria, do we want to be one? It's an assumption that we want to be. It's a, it's a terribly big and wrong assumption. Because when I went to Croatia, Croatia was part of the six countries that formed Yugoslavia. Right now, they're doing very well. Macedonia is doing very well. Slovenia is doing very well. Slovakia is doing very well. So nothing says that we must be one country. Nothing. It's not, it's not sacrosanct that we must be one country. If in being one country, you have all the killings you have in Jos, in Abuja, everywhere. What's the point being one country? So that's why in looking at President Tinubu's governance program, I would remind him of a structural engineer who says, I can't build this house, I can't build Nigeria on the basis of a weak governance structure. It is the most important and fundamental process if you want a country to grow. So Nigeria's governance structure is very weak. The first is any nation not at peace. And I always like to use the analogy of marriage. If, for instance, every day you get up and you, you and your wife are fighting, you cannot have peace. And you cannot think about how to develop. So the first thing we have to do in Nigeria is we have to organize peace. Because if we don't organize peace and security, you can't have good governance. So that is the step number one. And I also made the point at the lecture that to continue to do the same thing with the same result is a mistake. We cannot resolve our problem by military solution. It will not happen. Quote me. If we continue on this path to uh, deploy the military, deploy resources, I, mean, I don't even know how much has been spent by the military in uh, acquiring armaments. We can't win. And the simple reason is you don't use military sol solutions for what is called irregular warfare. Where do you find these Boko Haram people or the bandits? So military option will not give Nigeria peace. Rather, what you need is to go back and say, before 1914, who were the owners of Nigeria? When you invite those who were owners of Nigeria, Bini Kingdom, Bini Kingdom in the Guinness Book of Records has the largest man-made structure in the world. The wall they built is bigger than the Chinese uh, wall. People don't know this. So that is an extremely old empire. And the man who sits on that throne, the Oba, controls a humongous amount of political power. Then you count the MS, you count my own OB, yet you exclude them from the process of development is a huge error. It's a huge error. So this is what we need to do. We need to bring in all these guys we need to bring in Ohaneze, Pandef, Arewa, um, Afenifere. These are the people that will shape Nigeria and give us political peace 
for development. So that's the first point on governance, on political governance. Then the second point on governance concerns the issue of uh, what is the proper constitution that we need to have? Because all the constitutions we've had have been imposed, right from the uh, colonial to the military to the one that uh, General Absalom imposed, and then the one the National Assembly is now conducting, you know, and it has taken them 23 years. I think that's a very long time for us to have a constitution that no one even believes and respects. So I looked up. I did some research, and I, and I, I found Professor, late Professor Mwabeze's um, um, theory on a new constitution very interesting. He says that the National Assembly may not be, and I repeated it to President Babio, may not be aware of the nature of their powers. So I pointed out that the National Assembly has three legislative powers. The first is the National Assembly sitting as the House of Assembly of the federal government. The second is the National Assembly sitting as the House of Assembly of the FCT. Then the third is the National Assembly sitting as the House, uh, as the House of Assembly of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. It is a power they've never used. So Mwabeze suggests that they could use that to just establish a new constitution. All they need to do is to consult people. The constitution people don't understand is not as sacrosanct as it sounds. Because it's, a, it's an act that attaches the, the schedule. So one business suggests, just delete the schedule, that's the current constitution, and add a new one. So all these discussions that have been taking place, create, write up something that is agreeable, send it around Nigeria, and once it's accepted, you go to the National Assembly, invoke the powers of Section 4, Subsection 1, and then exchange. This happened when the Republican Constitution was established. The Parliament removed, by deletion, the Independence Constitution, and they put the uh, Republican Constitution in exactly one day. Our National Assembly has spent 23, 23, uh, 23 years. Because if you don't have the foundation, you can't go anywhere. So we don't have security. Our political foundation is weak. Our Constitutional Foundation is weak. Two vital instruments for development. The judiciary, is, as in my 45 years, never been as low as this. Even the Supreme Court, John Okoro, castigated the appeal court for a terrible judgment where they removed virtually everybody in the uh, plateau uh, political system. So we can't grow if we have a weak judiciary. And therefore, the only way to go is to break up this mafia in the Supreme Court. But to break it up is like saying, you know what? All women, no woman in Nigeria shall be entitled to political office. That's what they've done to us in the judiciary. No lawyer is entitled. It's only them. They create a mafia, block us out, and appoint themselves. Incestuous relationship. So they can't be their best. So. I recommended to the National Assembly to, to understand the difference between administration of justice. That's why judges take note and write versus judicial administration. In respect of judicial administration, the National Assembly can intervene. I, I could see uh, President Babio looking a bit puzzled when I was making that point. I said, are you sure we can do this? Of course, because already there are laws. There's the Federal High Court Act, which sets out how judges should come to the court, how they should be composed. The only thing the Constitution says is you must be 15 years to be a Supreme Court judge, nothing else. So we need a law, the Supreme Court Appointment Act or whatever, to regulate the appointment of and the composition of the courts. In the case of uh, some of the courts, they, it specifies that the person learned in Sharia law and customary law must be part of it. So why should somebody who is from the bar not be considered in the composition? To keep excluding the bar and the academics will result in a weak um, uh, uh, judicature. He's got off to a good start. He's kicked the engine of his aircraft. 
he's gone on to the wrong way, and the most difficult time for a pilot is when you're climbing out. So he's on the climb out. But remember that a, a, a pilot can always radio air traffic control, that he wants to make an air return. So we're at a point where we cannot say the climb out will reach cruising height. We can, an air return is, is a possibility. Unless all what I'm saying, you know, you may say, well, you might have been talking. But what I'm saying, as far as I'm concerned, is a very vital component of how Nigeria can reach cruising heights. Otherwise, the captain may be looking for the nearest airport to, to, to return to and land. Moving on now, Nobel laureate Professor Wale Shoinka has tasked President Bola Tinobu to address the issue of one Mubarak Bala who was sentenced for alleged blasphemy, as well as one Rhoda Juba who was jailed for condemning an extrajudicial killing. Professor Shoinka, who spoke at the 20th anniversary celebration in honor of late Chief Ghani Faemi in Lagos, also tasked lawyers to do more to protect the human rights of citizens. I met the president, as some of you may have noticed, a few weeks ago. First meeting, by the way, anyway, for public consumption, in about five years, first meeting. And one of the items, in fact, the top of the top on the list of my items was the plight of one Mubarak Bala, who's been in jail, going now for three years, sentenced in another part of this country for alleged blasphemy. I want to know from this association, from this gallery, where in our constitution it says that any citizen can be sentenced for blasphemy, sentenced to prison. And he's there, he's there, he's still awaiting. Um, I think there's been an appeal to the Supreme Court, but I believe that that process should have been short-circuited long ago. To make matters worse, a woman called Rhoda Ju Jubat, Jubat same, thank you, was similarly sentenced for criticizing the extrajudicial murder of Deborah not a citizen of this nation. She was released thanks to the effort of the Human Rights Association just a few weeks ago. Forget how long she spent in prison. That a human being is sentenced for condemning a criminal act, an inhuman act, and yet, I'm sorry, I'm asking where were you, all of you, when this happened? I didn't know about it. I have an excuse at least. I'm teaching outside. But you were here, and this woman was sentenced, and it took the efforts of a human rights association, finally, after several months, to get her out of jail for defending the law, for insisting on justice. There's something criminally wrong about this nation. And when I spoke to the, the President Shinumbu, I called his attention to an open letter by Mubarak Bala, to the president after his inauguration, small pamphlet to which I added my own preface and a poem. During that meeting, it was the first item. He'd never heard of it, even though I'd handed it over to somebody close to him who promised that he would make sure it was handed to him personally. However, that's one individual. What about the medium? The media, I beg your pardon. Did they report it? Because when I came out, they asked me, what did you discuss? And I said, a seven-point agenda. I said, the top of the list was the issue of Mubarak Bala. How many of our media carried that item? No, instead, you were playing sensational, uh, useless argument with uh, Wallace Shoenka said he always gives each incoming president one year uh, before he makes any comment. Why? And so, I mean, what kind of garbage? Is it any wonder that the social media is what is taking over the narrative and communication, information and opinion in this nation? So I, I just mentioned that uh, to illustrate the many, uh, the many obstacles to human understanding and uh, collaborative efforts in the transformation of society, of which 
of all the institutions that I know of, the so-called social media has become the most culpable. We're relying on you, the Bar Association, you who know the law, and who know what remedies are available to save this nation from the vileness that the social media has become. Uh, it's become impossible. There's something I believe called identity theft also. Is it recognized in the Constitution? I don't remember. In the law, in the protocols, I don't remember. But if it's not there, please help us to put it there. So at least we can all answer our Father's name and be responsible for whatever is put out in our names. Thanks for staying tuned. The Nigerian Bar Association is set to begin a mentorship and welfare program where lawyers will be assigned to law firms for grooming. The NBA president made this known at a national summit of young NBA lawyers in Abuja. According to him, the association will handle all the negotiation with these firms on work conditions and welfare. The pilot program, according to the NBA, is expected to kick off on February 1st this year. We have more details in this report. Young lawyers from across the country have converged in Abuja for a national summit with the aim of charting a new path in the Nigerian Bar Association and governance in general, with the theme, Breaking the Old Order of Governance. Thank you. In attendance is the president of the Nigerian Bar Association, the Minister of Interior, among others. Merci. In this venue are the future of the legal practice in Nigeria. Someday, there will be like the senior advocates around today. With the right guidance and mentors, they should be able to scale through all the challenges and attain the prestigious rank. You're welcome, sir. The president of the association, Yakubu Mikyo, lets them know about the MBA's mentorship program for young lawyers. I will take the privilege to announce at this meeting something that we had promised. We had worked on it, we came up with a report, and I think it is time for us to begin to implement it. That is the mentorship program of the Nigerian Bar Association. As a pilot scheme, as a pilot scheme, by the special grace of God Almighty, we would commence in earnest by February, by the first of February 2024. And this is what we are going to do. The entire concept of the mentorship program is to have young lawyers assigned to law firms across the country so that young lawyers can work in those law firms, both the law firms and the Nigerian Bar Association would agree on what stipends will go to these young lawyers at the end of every month for the period that they would stay in that law firm. You will learn, you will learn from the law firms how they do their things. You will learn the kind of practice that they do. You will learn the attitude and the approach to work. And so we are careful about the law firms we send you to. But as for the purpose of a pilot project, you know we have to do it carefully. We are also concerned about exposing you to the wrong things. So what we do for a start is to have two young lawyers from the three zones of the Nigerian Bar Association, from the east, from the west, and from the north that would start this pilot project. I don't know who those young lawyers are, I don't know who they would be, but they would simply emerge in the course of this month before the end of January 2024, and they will be assigned to law firms in these locations, in the east, in the west, and in the north, where they will spend a minimum of six months undergoing this mentorship program. Who knows, at the end of that mentorship program, you probably might turn out to be a better counsel than the one that they have hired, and that provides you with an automatic employment. The Minister of Interior and Chairman of the Young Lawyers Forum you. emphasized the need to break the old order of governance in order to fix Nigeria's challenges. The responsibility ahead of us as young people in government it's not just to break the old order, but it's to set a new template for generations yet unborn. 
I always say this, I cannot blame myself for the Nigeria my father handed over to me, but I will hold myself responsible if I hand over the same Nigeria to my children. And that should be the spirit of governance. That should be the spirit of administration. That should be the spirit of public service. Most times, we blame the past for the occurrences of today. But we lose sight on tomorrow. And I say this, God never gave us eyes to be at the back. He gave us our eyes to be in front so that we can look into the future. For us as younger ones, please, this is not the time to complain. Please, let's believe in this country. Let us understand that there is nothing wrong with Nigeria that cannot be made right by Nigerians. And that is the spirit. That it's business as usual does not mean it should continue. Finally, let me thank you for inviting me. In Ministry of Interior as a young person, I have tried to show that our generation is ready. Please join me in making sure that in Nigeria we will be handing over to our children will be greater than the one we inherited from our parents. Breaking the whole order of governance and advocacy means how do we do things right? Do we keep on doing what our parents, our grandparents have been doing? Are we going to achieve the desired results? Um, I guess not. So that is why we came up with this idea. These young lawyers are poised to bring out a transformation in the legal profession and the country as a whole. They will most likely seek to elevate it by performing their assigned duties differently, aiming for improved outcomes. And just before we go, a recap of some of the top legal stories in the news. We begin with the report that the Supreme Court has upheld the election of Sheriff of Borovori as governor of Delta State. The five-man panel dismissed the appeal of Ovi Omoagege seeking to overturn the elections. Justice Inyang Okoro, who led the panel, held that the appellant was unable to prove his case of overvoting and non-compliance with the electoral laws. The justices also dismissed the appeals of the SDP as well as the Labour Party for lacking in merit. The judgment was unanimous and the court made no award as to costs. The same panel dismissed the appeal filed by La Debutu of the PDP, challenging the victory of Governor Dakwa Biodo of Ogun State. In his appeal, Mr. La Debutu contends that the election of Governor Dakwa did not comply with the electoral laws as the governor did not score the lawful majority of votes cast in the elections. He asked the court to void the elections. In its judgment, the Apex Court dismisses the appeal for lacking in merit. In another judgment, the Supreme Court, led by Justice Kujirat Kekereyakun, dismissed the appeal of the PDP governorship candidate for Nasarawa State, David Ombugadu, for lacking in merit. The panel also dismissed the appeal of the PDP candidate in Gumbe State, challenging the election of Governor Inu Wayahaya, as well as that of Aminu Bande of the PDP, challenging the election victory of Governor Nasir Idris of Kebi State. The last appeal the panel heard was that filed by the PDP governorship candidate Isa Ashiru, challenging the election of Governor Ubasani of Kaduna State. Here, the appeal court also affirmed the judgment of the lower courts, which affirmed the election victory of Governor Ubasani. All the judgments were unanimous, and no cost was awarded in any of the appeals. Meanwhile, the appeals in the elections of Sokoto, Taraba, and River State are still pending before the Supreme Court. In the Sakwato suit, Mr. Seydu Umar of the People's Democratic Party is seeking to void the election of Ahmed Aliyu of the All Progressives Congress, APC, as Sakwato State Governor, while in the Taraba case, Mr. Sani Yahaya of the New Nigeria People's Party, NNPP, is seeking the sack of Governor Kefas Agbu of the People's Democratic Party. The Supreme Court has also reserved judgment in the appeal filed by the governorship candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Patrick Tonya Kool, against the victory of the River State Governor, Simnalai Fubara, in the March 18, 2023 governorship election. 
Mr. Tonye Cole's case is a fallout of the appeal court's decision of 28th November, which dismissed his appeal for lacking sufficient and convincing evidence. The APC governorship candidate's contention is that of irregularities, non-compliance with the Electoral Act, and Fubara's continued signing of documents as the River State's Accountant General after his nomination as governorship candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP. The five-member panel of justices heard by Justice Kudirat Kekireku after hearing the appeals separately adjourned till a date to be made known to parties. The Sokoto governorship case lapses on the 25th of January, while that of Taraba will elapse on the 26th. And we round off with the report that the federal government has rearranged the former CBN governor, Godwin Emefiele, on an amended 20-count charge. The fresh 20-count charge dated January the 17th, 2024, was filed by counsel to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Rotsimio Yedepo, and three others on behalf of the Attorney General of the Federation. It contains new counts relating to fraudulent award of contracts, forgery, conferring of corrupt advantage, and criminal breach of trust, among others. At his arraignment on Friday, Emefiele pleaded not guilty. The former CBN governor who was on bail before his rearrangement was granted leave by Justice Hamza Moazu to travel out of the FCT, but not out of the country. While granting the request for bail, the trial judge adjourned the case to February the 12th and 13th for continuation of trial. And this is where we are joined proceedings for today. Do remember to check out the Channel TV website for a replay of this episode of the program as well as past episodes. Please also send in any feedback via our social media handles. I'm Shola Shaley. Thank you for watching and see you next week.